All righty. We're continuing in our uh, studies in the third book of Moses uh, called Leviticus. And um, we observed in this particular book that what the Lord is doing is he's speaking to the tribe of Levi, the priests in the Old Testament, and he's, he's showing them in particular how it is that they are to minister at the uh, tabernacle. The Lord, when we looked at our outline a number of weeks ago, we saw that what the Lord's doing here is in the first uh, number of chapters, God is making a provision for sin through sacrifices and through the various priesthood and, and uh, Levi and Aaron and the various uh, uh, duties they were called to. Spiritually, this is going to apply to us in the New Testament because we are priests unto God in Jesus Christ. And so we will see physical pictures here that will have spiritual application to us. We'll look tonight as we come to the uh, third chapter, which is about the peace offering. And as you can see on the outline here, the peace offering will be broken down into three categories in the uh, chapter by paragraph markings. Paragraph uh, with the marking verses 1 through 5 is a sacrifice from the herd. And then the second paragraph in 6 through 11 is a sacrifice from the flock. And then the third paragraph is a sacrifice from the goats. And then the actual law of the peace offering will be spelt out in the 11th or in the 7th chapter, verses 11 through 38. So, so we'll read tonight in, through this third chapter, and then we will comment. Let's take a look here at uh, Leviticus chapter 3, and in verse 1. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that's upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that's on them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. That's if it's an offering of the herd. Now in verse 6, you'll see, and if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump, it shall he take off hard by the backbone and the fat that uh, covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that's upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, and the kidneys, it shall he take away, and the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. Verse 12, And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of it, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation, and the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about, and he shall offer thereof his offering, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that's upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that's upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver, and the kidneys, and he shall take it away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. And there is the reading historically of the peace offering. Now, the peace offering has a similarity to what we read in chapter 1, which was the burnt offering. In the burnt offering, they were allowed to bring of the herd, and they were allowed to bring of the flock. And in the burnt offering, they would bring this offering to make atonement 
and they would fillet it and cut it in pieces and then burn it by fire. And it was entirely burnt up. Now the difference here is that with the peace offering, certain parts are to be offered by fire on, upon the burnt offering and other parts are actually to be eaten as food and to be partaken of by the one that makes the offering. So this is a, a, an offering of a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice that's to be partaken of by the offerer in this particular offering. Now, as I was looking at this, you know, of course, verse 1 through 5, we have the herd. Uh, verse 1, if it be a sacrifice uh, of a peace offering, if he offered of the herd. Now, the herd were the most expensive animals in Israel. You'd, you'd have to be a a more wealthy Jew, like a rancher, like a Ben Cartwright, you know, the Ponderosa, and, and you, have, you have more money. And, and when you brought this particular animal, the difference between the burnt offering and this one is the burnt offering could only be a male. And the peace offering, it can be a male or a female. You could bring either a bull or an ox, male, or you could bring a cow, and that would be acceptable to the Lord in the peace offering. The same thing in verse 6, uh, if the offering be a sacrifice of peace offering uh, unto the Lord of the flock. Now the flock was a, a little bit less, uh, more middle class, uh, it was not uncommon for middle class Jews to have uh, sheep, uh, male sheep, rams, or uh, female sheep, the ewes, or even verse 7, a lamb, a, a baby sheep, and uh, that would be like a uh, was that little house on the prairie? They were more middle class than Ben Cartwright. You know, they, they would have that type of a thing, and they could bring an offering like that. And then finally, the poorest of the poor in verse twelve could bring a goat, and a goat you could just find out in the wilderness on the mountain somewhere and bring one of those. Now, in in order to to begin to understand this thing, I, I was observing there were certain aspects of it that were repeated into what would be burnt and what would not be burnt. And the parts that were burnt in the peace offering, verse 3, offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering made by fire unto the Lord, you offer the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards. I don't know if you've ever dissected animals, but there's this glistening golden fat on the inside. Some more than others, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. But, but there's the glistening fat. And, and, uh, and not only that, uh, underneath the skin is there that glistening fat, but when you get inside the cavity of the body, there's this golden fat. He's mentioning some of it here. Uh, the fat that is on the kidneys, which is by the flanks back here. And the call above the liver, there's, there's a golden area above the liver that just sweeps across the top of the liver. And it's golden like fat. Now, now what that call is, my, the nurse in the back knows, is the pancreas. That's the call above the liver. It's the pancreas. It's a, a fatty endocrine organ. It's a combination endocrine, exocrine organ in there. Uh, and, and that's what it is. So that fat is taken, and the kidneys are taken, and the liver is taken. Now, the kidneys and the liver, if you understand a little about them anatomically, is, is that they are very blood-rich. The, the liver is just... I mean, it's just loaded with blood. It just a liver. It's got all these uh, vessels in there throughout, woven in and out, uh, and hexag hexagonal shapes. And just you cut through it, and it bleeds. One of the most difficult things you have in surgery is if you accidentally cut the liver. Oh, it's just a nightmare to try and get that thing to stop bleeding. It's just very, very difficult. Every time you put a stitch in, just the needle that goes through when the suture comes out, the needle holes keep bleeding. I mean, it's just so very difficult. It's full of blood. And the kidneys are like that too. They're loaded with blood. And so these organs are very blood rich that the Lord is taking here. So what you have is you, you're offering the um, fat all along that outside there. And you're offering the blood rich inner part. Now, in order to understand this, the only way I could get this is as I started to draw back and look at the sacrifices in group, and, and I began to get some understanding on my own. And I, I certainly pray this is right, because <laughs> this is mine. I don't have this anywhere else. So you're going to read his stuff, hopefully, the Lord gave me. And, and I'm looking at these offerings now, and we'll, we'll try and look at them 
for the various offering, we'll look at the historical, the doctrinal, and the spiritual applications of the offerings that I can see the best I can. Now, in chapter 1, we had the offering that was the burnt offering. The burnt offering was to make atonement for the soul. And I notice this peace offering comes in the third chapter, and here's the way I see it happening. The burnt offering, doctrinally, historically we know what it was. They would bring these offerings and they would slay them and they would burn them as God prescribed. But doctrinally, it's a picture of Christ. And it's a picture of Christ's work at Calvary. He was the one that gave all of himself an offering to the Lord where every part of what he gave was acceptable and it was a sweet savor unto the Lord and it represents Christ's work at Calvary. And spiritually, what it represents to, and I'm putting a believer here, but the spiritual application is to the whole world. The problem is, turn to Romans chapter 3, I'll show you. You see, the, the work of Christ as the burnt offering, the work at Calvary, is offered to the whole world. Matthew 27. He gave himself an offering for sin, the crucifixion chapter. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all. Through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, he said, Father, I come to do thy will. And in faithfulness to his Father and the covenant he made before the foundation of the world, he was willing to give himself, Matthew 27, as the burnt offering at Calvary. And this is the righteousness of God, which is offered to the whole world, manifested by the law and the prophets, the picture of the coming Messiah, one that will come, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. And that's what's being offered here. Now the offer, verse 22, by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. But spiritually, observe, upon all them that believe. Spiritually, the burnt offering is partaken of by you and me at the point of repentance, at the point of belief, at the point of faith and receiving what Jesus Christ did as the doctrinal burnt offering. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Are you following me? Doctrinally, it's Christ's work. How do, I, how do I get any part of that burnt offering today? I mean, I'm not historically a Jew. How do I get it today? At the point of repentance, you spiritually partake of the burnt offering that Christ did at Calvary. So what's happening here is now you are doing what is told in Romans 10. You are, and we quote the verses all the time, what saith it, Romans 10, 8? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou, here you come spiritually, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You now partake spiritually in the burnt offering today when you repent and you confess and you believe. And now you've partaken. That's the first step of priesthood as a Levite today, if you will, a spiritual Levitical priest. Now, looking at the next chapter, along comes God's picture of the meat offering. We studied it last week. The meat offering had no um, cow, no flesh, had no beef, had no pork. It, it was bread. It was unleavened bread. The meat offering of chapter 2 was unleavened bread. And we saw historically that's what it was. They would make these cakes of unleavened bread, pure unleavened bread of fine flour. That was the meat offering. Now, doctrinally, it's the picture. Look at, again, Christ is the burnt offering. That's the work of Christ. Now you come to the Bible. This is the word of Christ. The meat offering is now the word of Christ. This is what Christ has given you and me to partake of as the believer spiritually. When you read the word of Christ, you are now partaking 
of the meat offering today. We saw that the meat offering metaphorically was a picture of the Bible. We saw that in the meat offering there was a memorial mentioned repeatedly in the chapter. The memorial was Calvary. All through the Bible is the picture of Calvary. But then we also saw there were other portions of the meat offering that were not a memorial. So what is that? You know how I often say to people, and I always say this on the streets when I'm preaching, the life of Jesus Christ can't save you. The miracles of Jesus Christ can't save you. The teachings of Jesus Christ can't save you. That's true. So what does save you? Well, it goes back to Calvary. The memorial of what he did is what saves you. His death and his burial and resurrection save you. However, when you and I partake of the meat offering, we now go beyond the first doctrines of Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection, and we partake of the life of Christ, and we partake of the teachings of Christ, and we partake of the sayings of Christ, and we grow in, in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So the meat offering goes beyond just the memorial, although the memorial is preeminent in the meat offering. When you get to the word, of Christ in the Bible, you as the believer now partake when you read and when you study. This is where you begin to get into it through the reading and the studying. Um, turn, for example, to the book of Hebrews. We'll see it in Hebrews. We saw the other examples in Romans. On this one, we'll see it in Hebrews. We'll look at Hebrews chapter 5 and 6. The meat offering. And I'm, I'm leading up to the peace offering so it will make sense to you as we get there. Because if I just walk into a cold, I didn't quite get it until I kept going back and looking at it and how God was layering this thing carefully. And then it began to make sense to me. All right. Hebrews chapter 5. Um, <laughs> Paul is trying to teach some people that they just won't seem to get their heart and their spirit in tune with the word of God. And he says in verse 11, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. That's a sad uh, reproof and rebuke that Paul has to make to people that would claim to know the word of God. I certainly hope he wouldn't say that to us, that he thinks we're dull of hearing. But, but I would say this, Christian, Prove your own self. Judge yourself that you be not judged. And it's between you and the Lord. It's not between me and you. It's between you and the Lord. But I don't know. We don't want to be dull of hearing. Verse 12. For when the time came, you know, when you ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk. That might be chapter 1, Christ at Calvary, the basics of salvation and not of strong meat. Now here's chapter 2, the meat offering. You're going beyond just the simple things. The meat offering. You need to partake of that meat offering. Um, uh, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Meat, those of full age, those that are growing, those are beyond just the memorial of Calvary. Now, I don't ever, I, I never minimize the importance of Calvary. We understand that. But there's a point where God wants you to, to layer upon what was done in Calvary, like he's layering on here with these chapters. Calvary chapter 1, but then layering upon and upon. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter, one, uh, chapter 4, verse 13. Till I come, give attendance to reading. Give attendance to reading. Show up. When God asks you to read, how often does he ask you to read? Every day. Every day. I mean, he just gave you a new day. His mercies are renewed every day. With the morning cometh the new day. He'd like you to redeem the time. Spend some time reading the Bible every day. Give attendance to reading. God's up there taking attendance. In the books. Did they show up today? You know, did Debbie show up today? Let me see. Oh, she was absent. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Lord knows these things. Did Mike show up? No, he missed. I hope not, Lord. But, but I, I, you know, give attendance to reading. You better be very sick if you're not going to read. You better have a good excuse. <laughs> Lord, I was very sick today. I couldn't read. I, I, I give attendance to reading. The meat offering. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Study to show thyself approved unto God. 
Not unto the pastor. Not unto your spouse. Not unto your fellow Christian. But unto God. See, the meat offering gets partaken of spiritually when the believer reads. The burnt offering when he repents. The, 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 the meat offering when he reads. Christ, the work of Christ in chapter 1, the burnt offering. Christ, the word of Christ in chapter 2, the meat offering. Very, very important. Now, because it's going to lead up to the third chapter, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to say from my observations in the time I've been saved since 1993, very few num members of Christianity ever get to chapter 3 today. Because chapter 3 is going to be the peace offering, and it's going to follow after you've been through chapter 1 and 2 spiritually. And you're going to see this, the way God's going to layer these things on. And, and uh, I'm just an observation that I'm making here. Now, when you, when you get to this offering today, the peace offering, this is going to represent doctrinally the third work of Christ. And the third work of Christ, now that he has done his work at Calvary, and he has faithfully given you every word. Father, I gave unto them the words that thou gave unto me. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. I've given them. I'm going to do this at Calvary. I'm going to see to it they have the words. Now, the third work I'm ready to do is the work of worship in your heart. Proper worship. We go from work to word to worship is the peace offering. The peace of perfect worship. Worship in spirit and truth is the third work doctrinally that Christ wants to do in your heart. And let me show you this in terms of the peace offering. I want to show you, I'll show you doctrinally a number of verses and then spiritually for the believer and, and how that's entered into for you. And this is why on this particular offering, a male or a female is accepted with God. Why? Because Jesus Christ wants to do the work of worship in male and female hearts. He wants the worship to come from both. He created the male and female, and that's his desire. Now, for the burnt offering, it would not be acceptable to bring a female, obviously, because the burnt offering doctrinally is Christ's work at Calvary, and that could only be the Son of God the only begotten Son of God. But when it comes to the peace offering and the work that Christ wants to do in your heart, there's neither male nor female. He wants to get into both hearts and do his work. So let me show you on this peace offering. Go to Isaiah. We'll run a number of verses there starting in the ninth chapter. This is the peace offering. It's going to represent Christ and you. There will be a dual typology in it. Christ and you. The preeminent being Christ, the subordinate being you. Isaiah 9. We'll look at the Christ applications first. Jesus Christ. It's Christ in worship. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Now, now you know in this chapter, I just want to, taking up to that verse, which is a famous verse, Verse 1 and 2 is quoted in the New Testament. Nevertheless, the dimness, that's, that's a lack of light, okay, that's darkness, shall not be such as which in the vexation when at the first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward are more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. Here it is, verse 2. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And this is again quoted in Matthew when uh, Jesus came and, and the light of Jesus Christ is coming. So it's going to be about Jesus Christ bringing light. Verse 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Doctrinally, the peace offering is the Prince of Peace in worship. 
The only proper peaceful worship you'll ever have when you come before the creator God of heaven is when you're coming on the grounds of the son, the child that was born, the son that was given upon whom the government rests his shoulders. That's the only proper peace you'll ever have in worship. If you try and conduct any other peace offering or any other kind of worship on this planet, I will assure you, you do not have peace in your heart. I can say this with the assuredness of scripture. The best you can have is a kind of false peace, but you always got that lingering doubt. Is what I'm doing accepted by God? And there will always be that question. You were just talking about it tonight. The, the brother was telling us that, that some letters were found by Mother Teresa that said in the last years of her life that she was even doubting if there was a God. She was a woman without peace. How is that possible? Because she was not coming God's way. She never came through chapter 1 and received the finished work of Christ at Calvary. I think she tried to bring a female offering to chapter 1. And God says, that's impossible. I don't want you work, Mother Teresa. It can only be the male offering of my son. Now, if you'll come there and come my way and start reading the Bible, you'll have peace one day. But if you will not come to Calvary first and you will not read my word, you will not have peace. And so only the Prince of Peace can bring the peace offering that gives right worship in the heart. That's doctrinally. Go to Isaiah chapter 32. It must be the Prince of Peace, Isaiah chapter 32. These... These offerings roll one upon another like the rolling waves and the billows that flood upon the soul. And God is doing it decently and in order. And we must follow. It was what Jesus Christ had done in chapter 1, followed by his revelation in chapter 2, that allows anyone to come to chapter 3. You don't get the peace offering if you don't get the first two in place. Isaiah 32, look at verse 17. And the work of righteousness, chapter 1, shall be peace, chapter 3, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. You're going to see that the peace offering in the believer is now where he rests. In chapter 1, he repents at Calvary. In chapter 2, he reads his Bible. But when he gets to chapter 3, and he's done it decently in order in God's way, he now rests with quietness and assurance and peace inside his heart. It's a form of worship that he knows is acceptable to God. And God confirms it with, Jesus said, but my Father and I will dwell in you. We will make our abode with you. And that's the peace offering rolling. Turn to Isaiah 53. Now why it had to be this way is understood in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Again, tying that offering and mingling it with the first chapter. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. You could not have the peace offering if you don't come through chapter 1. Doctrinally, the, the peace offering is Jesus Christ's work in the heart. And of course, what he had to go through to achieve that. He's the peace offering. So therefore, Paul mentions to us in Romans chapter 5 in that great doctrinal epistle, and verse 1, And Paul kind of, Paul kind of takes these, these three chapters and inverts the order and he puts 1, 3, 2. And watch how he does it. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, chapter 1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, chapter 3, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. In other words, we're continuing by faith, by the word of faith, by reading the Bible and staying in this chapter 2. It's all tied together. It's interwoven. It's like God will not allow them to be separated. These three offerings come together. And if you remove one of these foundations, things begin to crumble. Especially if you remove foundation number one, you're finished. You're absolutely finished. Now, now it's possible to have number one and not have two. Maybe have a smattering of three, but not very much. It's possible to have number one, 
have two and still not have very much of three. Well, what the Lord would like you to have is one, two, and three. And in order to have three properly, it's going to be a work in your heart. And we're going to see this. This is why he talked about those inner parts. And it's going to have to be a work on the inside. And it's going to have to be a yielding of you on the inside for this to happen. Now, now go to Ephesians chapter 2. Again, doctrinally, I'm showing you Christ is the peace offering in the heart for proper worship, connected to the work that he did. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. There's his offer in chapter 1. For he is our peace. Doctrinally, the peace offering primarily will be Jesus Christ bringing peace to your heart through the atoning work that he did at Calvary and through you reading about him and feeding on him daily in the word. And as you feed, he brings our peace. He hath made both one. That's why the male and female could come. The male and the female. Now here, he's speaking about the Jew and the Gentile. But whether it be male, female, Jew, Gentile, bond or free, he makes them one in this peace offering through his blood. He's broken down the middle wall of partition between us. That's the work there. The peace offering later on, he'll explain in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20, is that Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.20, has made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. There's the worship in the heart. What the Lord wants to draw to you and me in the heart is worship, spiritual worship, pure worship. Woman, you worship, you know not what. You're trying to worship at a place. You're trying to worship by tradition. The vain conversation of your fathers. Salvation is of the Jews, and this Jew will offer himself a sacrifice at Calvary that will be accepted to God, will give you Jewish oracles that you can read about it, and then you can have proper worship in spirit and truth. Not just one or the other. You cannot have proper worship in spirit alone. You cannot have proper worship just in the Bible alone. It's people with the King James Bible that aren't saved. It must be spirit and truth. It must be spiritually coming and repenting at Calvary and having the truth of the authorized version of the scriptures and partaking of that that allows true worship to happen in the heart. And now the peace offering begins to happen in your heart. Spiritually, spiritually to you, let me give you the verses that would apply. Go back to Isaiah 26 and we'll run a lot of these books again and watch now it goes from doctrinally to Christ and him the faith of Christ to your faith in your heart, spiritually to you in Isaiah 26. This is where you find your rest in the proper worship. I, I, the only place where I really have rest today is in true worship. When I'm outside of true worship, I'm a little restless. Now, maybe you're not, because I think most of you are more spiritual than I am, you know. But I, I have trouble outside of true worship. These are the best times for me. When we're in the house of God, something God does something. He must put a wall of fire around the church house and keep the bad spirits out. And it's just like stepping into eternity. And we're opening the Word of God, and we're singing the hymns, and we're all together, and our little candles are together, and the candlestick, and the light's bright, and it's true worship. And when I'm away from here... I have to enter into the true worship alone with the Lord, reading. And lots of times it's in the early morning or late at night, I mean, when I really get that quietness and away from everything. But, it's, but when I'm outside of that, I get a little restless. I must admit, I'm a person. I am like passions. I have fears. I, I get concerned. Things happen in my life. <laughs> and then when I'm in the true worship, and the peace offering, and I'm offering myself, and I'm allowing myself to rest on the offering of Christ, and I'm partaking of what he's given, 
there's it's Isaiah chapter 26, um, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Chapter 2, partaking of the meat, reading. Because he trusteth in thee. Why? Because you've given me every word. What a revelation that was to me when I knew that I could trust my Bible for every word. It was a slippery book before that. What does that footnote say? It's not in the better manuscripts? What does that say? These, these verses don't belong here? What does that footnote say? Maybe he's not the Son of God? What is that? Now all of a sudden I have a book where I'm trusting in God. God. I'm not leaning on my understanding. I'm trusting in the Lord with all my heart. And my mind is at perfect peace as it stayed on the words that he's given me here. And I move from chapter 2 to 3 in the rest in my heart. There's the peace offering that we enter into. Let me show you in the New Testament. We were in Romans before. We'll look at Romans 8. I, I'm going to tell you, folks, I couldn't see this thing. I'm walking, what is this peace offering all about? Until I began to layer it on the other offerings. And to see that when I put Christ in the middle, and I saw Calvary, there's his work. The Bible, there's his word. The heart that rests in peace, there's true worship in the heart. Where does God want to dwell? In your heart by faith. It's heart worship, heart to heart, deep calling on the deep. There's the peace offering, Romans chapter 8, verse 6. And again, how important it is to go through chapter 2 of reading the word and the meat. To be carnally minded is death. Okay? You, you read a magazine. You read a romance novel. Uh, you, you, you know, watch a TV program. It, it doesn't do anything for your heart. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. How do you get the spiritual mind? Well, you read the words that God put to fill your mind and to fill your heart. And then all of a sudden comes the peace offering right here. The spiritual mind and heart through the spiritual words. My words are spirit and they are life. That's John 6. That's where he told you, I'm the meat offering. I'm the meat offering. What do you mean? My words are spirit. Partake of the spiritual word, Christian. Read and study that Bible and peace will break upon your soul. That's what he's saying. Uh, we were in Ephesians 2 before. Go back to Ephesians 2 and look at the, the 14th verse was showing us that he is our peace. But the 15th, 16th, and 17th verse is showing us how we will enter into some of that peace. 15. He abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. I mean, he made peace with God up and down for us. He made peace with us across what would be called racial boundaries. There was a big racial separation between the Jew and Gentiles. And he broke down that wall too. He broke down the veil between God and us. And he broke down the wall between one to another. It's an amazing thing. I was watching a television program with a Jewish man. Heavy guy with a beard. Chuckling, smiling with a Bible. And across from him was an Arab man, heavy guy with a beard. The Jewish man had been raised by a rabbi. The, the, the Arab man had been raised by a Muslim imam. And both of them had found Christ. And they were just sitting there smiling and hugging each other and having a great time. Where are you going to find that? He abolished the enmity. He was able to make peace between those that you would seem there could be no peace through Jesus Christ. There could be peace. It was a wonderful thing to behold. It's just, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I mean, I don't know what enemies you had before, but, but when you become a Christian and they become a Christian, you hug each other, brother, sister. It's just, it's wonderful. Verse 16, that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Chapter 1, the burnt offering, having slain the enmity thereby. And now watch this. Verse 17, and came and preached peace. To you, 
Here are the words, the spiritual words coming out. You see, one of the ways that you and I will enter into that peace is, uh, he says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now you say, well, the gospel of peace means I go out and I preach to a lost man how he can have peace with God. But you want to know something? When you go out and you preach the gospel, it's a gospel of peace to yourself. There's a great peace in preaching the gospel. It becomes the gospel of peace. I, I go out on the street and I preach the gospel of peace. Now, I'm preaching the gospel of peace to them, but it's very peaceful to me. It's wonderful. It is the most... I, I don't know how to use the word. I'm going to use the word natural, although I, it's not natural because the natural man doesn't like it. But I guess the most natural for the spiritual man, it, it's just an amazing thing. I, when you're out there preaching the gospel, you have great peace. Have the, they which love thy law and preach thy law. And there's peace coming over you. And it's the peace of God which passeth understanding. That's exactly what's happening to you when you're in the midst of doing that work. That's why the burnt offering was one that you could come in and you could identify with and lay your hands on because you are actually offering yourself to in the midst of that peace offering. Now the question is, Christian, are you offering yourself? You see, I think one of the reasons why so many Christians do not have the peace is they're not willing to make the offering. They want to come about as far as chapter 1 and say, you know, I'm real glad that you did that for me, Lord. Thanks for your atonement. That means a lot. I'll see you when I get to heaven one day. I know I'm going to get there because you promised I would, but I'd like to go my own way the rest of my life. I'm not going to meet offering. I hate that unleavened bread. That is just strange stuff. I, I loathe that light bread. I mean, I like the fish and the onions and the garlic and the leeks from Egypt, and I want to continue to partake on that stuff. Well, then there is no peace because you're not willing to enter in. You're not willing to preach the gospel of peace. You're not willing to be part of the offering. And that's what this, that's what this was. The Levites were coming and they were being part of the offering. Both the male and the females were allowed to come and to bring that offering to enter into the peace of God. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. This proper worship is, is really what God created us for. I mean, his desire was he created us for his pleasure and his glory and to the Father seeketh such to worship him. And here in our hearts we get the right worship and the peace breaks upon our heart. Uh, verse 6, be careful for nothing. You know, mothers always say, be careful, be careful. But what he's saying is, he's saying is, don't be full of cares for things in the world. So time, we're so full of care for this. You know, Martha, you're careful for this and you're careful about that, Martha. But Mary chose the better part. She came and sat at my feet and had the meat offering, okay? She was too busy trying to serve and she wasn't having peace. You don't get to chapter three till you stop at chapter two. And you're being too careful here, Martha, settle down. Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And you pray properly when you read properly. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now watch how this peace works. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, you'll find them in the Bible. Whatsoever things are honest, you'll find that in the Bible. Whatsoever things are just, that'll be in the Bible. Things are pure. That's in the Bible. Whatsoever things are lovely and whatsoever things are of good report. Well, that's in the Bible. If there be any virtue, any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. There's that peace offering. When you do it, now you're offering yourself into the peace offering upon Christ. Now go back to where we were in Leviticus 2. Or 3, excuse me. Leviticus 3. The peace offering. In verse 9. He says, And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof, 
and the whole rump. He shall take it off hard by the backbone and the fat that covereth the inwards and the fat that's on the inwards and the kidneys and the fat uh, upon them and the flanks and the call and the liver and the kidneys he shall take away and burn it. And then what was left over, the shoulder and the breast, he was allowed to partake of. So he offered something in peace and he was given something to partake of in peace. In other words, what was happening here is you're entering God's house and God's saying, I'm the host. And you come and you bring something to me and I have something to offer to you. And I'm going to give you the best part, the breast and the shoulder to partake of in the peace offering. That's going to be what you get to partake But you offer me the fat and the kidneys and the liver. And I thought about that. The inner parts, the uh, kidneys and the flanks and the livers and the fat on the inside, that's the inner piece that you offer. But then you offer two things on the outside. You offer the outer fat and the rump. Now, the rump is the gluteus maximus. It's the strongest muscle in the body. And, of course, the fat is very weak. And, I mean, the fat's pretty much good for not much. It's nothing, I would almost say, but a little bit of something. But, I mean, muscles can do something. Bones can do something. Fat just kind of blobs around and does nothing. So the fat is there, and yet your strongest muscle. And that's both supposed to be offered. Here's what God's saying. When it comes to peace... The peace isn't going to be due to your strengths or your weaknesses. The peace is going to be due to my son. It's going to be the peace of God that passeth understanding. You can take your strength, your gluteus maximus, the strongest part you have. You can take the weakest part of you, your fat, and you can just burn it up and put it aside because the peace is going to be given by me. I'm giving the peace unto you, the Lord says. It's my peace offered unto you. You're partaking in the prince of peace, not your peace. It's the peace of God which passeth understanding. I don't even get it, but I get it when I do it according to the way that it's proscribed. If I'm obedient and I do it, the Lord is faithful to fulfill his part. But if I try and do it my way, it doesn't kind of work out, which is why he's prescribing to the Levites, these sacrifices must be done decently and in order. These ways, these are the only ways I'll accept. And when I accept your worship, then I participate in your worship and I give myself to you. Now, we're almost done, but I wanted to show you one last thing that, that I got thinking on. And uh, it was verse number 12. And I want to see what you think about that verse. While I take a drink of water, you can read it. And I ask you a question. And if his offering be a goat. Now I notice a difference between that and verse 1 and verse 6. Verse 1 says, if it's of the herd, it can be male or female. Verse 6 says, if it's of the flock, it could be male or female. And verse 12 says, if it be a goat. And now, now I, I have a question for you. Let's say you were a Levite. And you're one day ministering in the courtyard there. And along comes a widow woman. And she's poor. She doesn't have a herd and she doesn't have a flock. And she comes walking up with this she-goat which was the only thing she was able to obtain out there in the wilderness. She brings a she-goat, a female goat, to you as the priest. Do you let her bring it as a peace offering? Would you let her bring it according to that verse? I see somebody nodding in the back. It doesn't say right, it doesn't say male or female. So how readest thou? So would you let her as a priest? Now, now, here is where I think we get into some Bible interpretation that's very interesting. So let's turn to the New Testament and see if it can help us. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Mike, do you believe the Bible literally or spiritually? Both. Both. And that's the key. Both. I know Christians that so spiritualize this book 
that if they were a Levite in the Old Testament and someone came with a camel or a pig arg, they would have accepted it. And that's unacceptable. But they just spiritualize. Then I know other Christians that are so wooden, nickel, literal with the book, they wouldn't see any liberty at all. And if it's a goat, it'd have to be a he-goat. And it didn't specify female, and it can't be a he-goat. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse, uh, end of verse 5. Our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Are you a literalist or spiritualist? Both. The literal letter covered by the Spirit. In the context, the way I would see it, understanding the spiritual writing style of the Holy Ghost, I spelled it out for you in verse 1, I would accept male or female. I spelled it out for you in verse 6, I would accept male or female. What do you think I think in verse 12? I'd say, well, contextually and spiritually, you would accept male or female. So yes, ma'am, please bring that she goat. Let's put your hands on it and we'll enter into the peace offering together. Now, I bring this up to you for a point because my observation is that some I don't know what to call them, other than the super saints, are so, so literal with this book, they don't see the spiritual context of, of verses. For, for example, I know a very fine man uh, who's, who loves the Lord greatly, has bowed the knee not only to Jesus Christ, but has understood that the King James Bible is the word of God, reads it faithfully every day. Um, and there was a particular church that didn't think that he would make a, a deacon because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it says that let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. And this man never had any children. His wife was childless. Now, now I think, again, you're getting, if you read the context of it, he's talking about the ability to rule and take care of your own house properly. And if you happen to be one to whom God did not allow your wife to have any children, that wouldn't be any reason to be shut out from being a deacon, spiritually. Sure. But I do understand a literalist not being able to think beyond that. I understand that. But I think God puts these things in here for us to see there is a literal and there's a contextual spiritual thing of uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. I know some that feel you can't even touch a woman. You can't touch a woman. Well, I mean, I understand literally, but what's the context of the entire passage? The context is touching her in a sexual manner and keep your hands off. But I touch women all the time. I'm a doctor. They're injured. I handle them. Sometimes in comfort, I'll put my arm around the shoulder of a woman. There's nothing wrong with that there. I'm looking at it spiritually, but I understand the literalist. And I just wanted to point that out for your thinking. Now, what you need to do is you need to pray about these things and read these things and be spiritual and allow the peace of God to work in your heart. And if it doesn't, then whatever you do that's not of faith, it's sin. And if you're fully persuaded in your own mind you can't do it, you can't do it. I understand that. I fully understand that. Spiritual book. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, one spiritual put the uh, physical in the middle of the spiritual. He put these written words, the spirit giveth life, the surround, that's the way it is. That's the way he works. So I just wanted to share that with you and I hope I didn't trip anyone up. The main thing I think we wanted to see tonight in this teaching is that when you look at these offerings, the doctrine will always be Christ. The burnt offering is the work of Christ at Calvary. The meat offering is the word of Christ in the Holy Bible, the one that the author gave you. The author and finisher of our faith gave you the authorized version of the Bible. He didn't give you any other version of the Bible. There's only one Bible, the one that bears his brother's name, James, the King James Bible. The King of Kings gave a Bible. And then the peace offering is the worship in your heart if you will follow chapters 1 and 2, if you will repent. And if you will read, then you will do what is spoken of in Hebrews chapter 4. Turn to Hebrews 4. And this is why the peace offering was such a unique offering 
in that you entered into it, bringing along with it. You could not enter into the burnt offering, but you entered into the peace offering and partook of it because God wants you to be a partaker of his peace. But the way it's done is like this. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That's a shame. There shouldn't remain that rest. They should all be entered into it, but many haven't. Verse 10, for he that has entered into his rest, God's rest, he also hath ceased from his own works. You're no longer doing your own works. You're doing the work of God now. That's what you're doing. Verse 11, let us labor therefore to enter into his rest. It almost sounds like an oxymoron. Let us labor to enter into rest? Precisely. Precisely. You've been saved to worship and serve. And both require labor. The proper worship requires labor. And the proper service requires labor. And if you will labor, you'll enter into the rest. And why are there so many restless Christians? They don't have the right book. And they won't labor to enter into the rest. And that's what the peace offering is about. And so tonight, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor in your own works and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. We're going to labor together. Learn of me. You shall find rest unto your souls. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, understanding of the peace offering as, it's, as it follows in, in uh, one after the other, consecutively after the perfect atoning work of the burnt offering and the perfect pure work of the meat offering. Help us to labor to enter into that rest of the peace offering, male or female, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, child or adult. Help us this week, I pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.